Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me today. So um, today I'll take you below our feet to investigate the transport and reactivity in the subsurface. So this presentation is based on the work of uh, mainly three PhD students, Ivan, Melissa and Charlotte, and um, highly benefited from the great support of the two Oscar engineers, uh, Elliot and uh, Sylvain, and other collaborators. So as you know, uh, groundwater is a crucial resource. It's the first, it's the biggest uh, freshwater resource on Earth, but uh, it's however threatened by anthropogenic pressure and uh, climate change. Um, groundwater is not only used for us, it's also supporting many ecosystems, such as uh, wetlands, rivering ecosystems, and the recent studies has shown that even woody plants access and largely transpire from groundwater. But groundwater is not only a resource that is crucial in terms of quantity, but also for quality. In, indeed, uh, very recent uh, studies have shown that we can really consider groundwater as a biogeochemical reactor, because many reactions occur in the subsurface. And as Jenny said earlier, it's way easier to have measurements of flows, even in um, in the subsurface, but knowing about chemistry, it's, more, more, it's much more complicated. But we know that the reactions that occur in the subsurface are, for instance, weathering reactions that are going to shape the critical zone and free some nutrients, but also um, reactions such as decontamination in certain contexts. And understanding the geochemistry of subsurface is complicated because of heterogeneity, which is a nightmare, I agree. And we see that the reactions that take place in the subsurface are actually often very intermittent and localized. In this study, what you see on the right is repeated measurements that have been made on oxygen contents in a, in a well. And you see that depending on the moment where we do the measurement, we see completely different patterns with inputs of groundwater or no inputs of oxygen, sorry, in the groundwater or no inputs of oxygen at all. And based on these inputs that are only intermittent, we can see that actually the reactions that is derived from the input of oxygen in the ground is very localized. And in this context, which is a fractured aquifer, we see that the reactions are localized at places where fractures intersect. Another new vision of how the chemistry takes place in the ground is to take uh, microbes into account. Indeed, we now know that microbes are very abundant in the subsurface. They could be one of the biggest reservoirs of biomass on Earth. And actually, because they live from the reactions that they do in the, in the subsurface, they play a central role in the biogeochemical cycles. All right, so I like to think as groundwater as the reservoir that connects all the critical zone. Indeed, it will connect the upper part of a catchment, the hills, the top of the hills, to the valleys. And so it's connected as well to the vegetation and of course it's drained by rivers. And the way that the water is transported from the top of the catchments to the valleys actually depends on the characteristic of the, of the, the aquifer, which is the so-called transport properties. Either the media is transmissive and then the water is going to be transported very quickly in the ground or less transmissive. And this really depends on the characteristics of the aquifer below our feet. Based on this, one easy uh, tracer that we often use is the age of water because we can consider that water is aging along its flow path. All right, this has been mainly used to better understand what we call the rudder rock interactions because the idea is that the longest the, the water is going to flow in the ground, the more time it has to interact with the subsurface and thus potentially to make reactions. However, as I've, as I've told you before, a lot of these reactions are actually not occurring linearly along the flow path, but can be very localized or intermittent, which make the complexity of groundwater even bigger. All right, so... We've seen with Jenny this morning that using data in a river is really useful because it's a great integrator of every processes that occur at the catchment scale. However, maybe this view of looking at the river, it's also a way to smooth the complexity of the subsurface and potentially hide major processes. 
Indeed, we've seen this morning that, for instance, an increase in flow that could be related to an increase of the groundwater levels can be associated with a change of the water chemistry. But I also told you before that when the groundwater levels are higher, we can see some increase of, for, ex for instance, oxygen in the ground that would yield a higher microbial activity. So you can see that it's not that easy to actually decipher between the different processes that occur in the ground, and that can, at the end, uh, yield to changes in the, sorry, to changes in the water chemistry. Therefore, uh, the, the whole uh, objective of this study is really to see what is this interplay between what we call the underground geomorphology, which is the structure of the subsurface, as I told you before, with different transport characteristics, but also the groundwater dynamic and the in-situ biogeochemical reactions. And as we, it has already been, already been said before, we actually need new tools to answer these questions because we are missing data in the subsurface because groundwater is very hard to access, so we have very few data, and so we need new tools to better explore the subsurface, to image its constituents, and also to monitor its dynamic. All right, so I'm going to show you some of these new tools we, that we had through three different studies. The first is a side-scale uh, transport reactivity uh, investigation, a second study is um, some uh, works that we've done to try to better constrain the in-situ reactivity on a short-term and long-term um, ways. And then the third study will talk about how transport can directly have a control on the reaction localization at catchment scale. All right, so I will try with the first study, studying transport and reactivity. So to answer this question, we decided to go to two very similar catchments, the Guidel and the Kermadua catchments. Both of them are located near the southern shore of, Br of Brittany, and they are very similar. They are like five kilometers apart from each other, same kind of size. The only small differences between these two catchments is that one is pumped here, one, and, the, and there is a slight difference in lithology because one is only on, on schist, while the other one also uh, is on granite. And the, the question was, are these two sites similar, or is there any differences in the ge geochemistry of these two sites? So to answer these questions, we actually chose an approach which was to simplify the complexity of the of the 3D catchment, and what we've decided is to really have a look and try to see the patterns of chemistry with depth. So in order to answer this question, we took for each point here that represents a well, we identified the idea was to have an, an idea of which water was uh, investigated at which bore. So to do this, we used some well logging of different elements such as dissolved oxygen, conductivity, and temperature. And what you see is that when we go deep in a well, the concentrations are actually not very different, and that most of the chemistry and even physical parameter of a well are characteristic of what arrives at this well at only one location. Here, for instance, on this well, you can see that there is an input of water that's arriving here at 45 meters, and that this water is actually flowing down in the well. So the whole well is actually filled with water that's only or mainly coming only from this fracture here. So what it means is that the information that we have from one well can actually be reduced to an information that we have of one depth and one concentration. So based on this well logging, what we did is that we identified the fracture that actually filled the, the whole well and defined one borehole as one depth and one concentration. All right, we did this operation for all the different wells that I've shown you on, this, on the map. And here is what we get. So here is the point that I've shown you previously. And the results that I show you are the, what we did before for oxygen and for iron. And all points, all wells of the two catchments have been reported here. And what we see is actually, despite the fact that the, the catchments are very similar, we have very contrasting chemical compositions. Indeed, the, the first catchment in green 
shows um, oxygen concentrations that are quickly depleted in, the, in depth, while iron concentrations are increasing, and the Kermadua catchment shows much higher O2 contents and actually much deeper oxygen inputs in the ground, while the concentrations of iron remain very limited. So here, it's, it's a first observation that, well, even if we think that sometimes uh, catchments are similar, they can be very different. And then what we try to do is to try to model these differences and understand what it comes from. So for this, we have made a very simple analytical model that is actually only driven by two parameters. So this is, this is really because we've simplified the system to only one dimension, dimension which is the concentration as a function of depth. And based on this, we are able to look at some analytical solutions, and we see that with these two parameters, the dam color number is actually the ratio of transport properties over in situ reactivity. And another parameter that we have defined that it's only depending on the reactivity. And what you see is that to, to model the uh, iron and oxygen composition in the ground, we have to use uh, very different parameters. The dam color is different by factor of four, and the lithological parameter is, di is different by orders of magnitude. So based on this, what we see is that the small differences, which is the, comp the lithological composition, the mineralogical composition of the catchment, can explain the large differences that we observe in terms of concentration. Actually, the difference that we put in the two catchments is only an increase of the biotite contents of 5% in the rock mineral. And that only explains the, the large discrepancies that we observe in terms of the chemistry of the two catchments. All right, so to conclude on this study, we've seen that here we found a nice way to look at the huge heterogeneity of the catchment and to reduce it to only one dimension, which is looking at chemistry with depth. And with this, we've been able to use an analytical reactive transport model to investigate and try to decipher between the hydrological and geological forcings. And we've, we've shown that completely contrasted chemical composition here between two quite similar catchments is however driven by some small mineralogical differences. All right, that brings me to my second study, looking at in situ reactivity. So this work is actually motivated by the so-called lab field discrepancy. Okay, most of you probably already know this plot that shows that when we look at and we try to quantify the kinetics associated with reactions, so the reaction rates, we see that there is a huge difference between reaction rates that are derived in the lab and reactions rates that are quantified based on integrated and average measurements on a catchment scale. Well, actually, these differences, when now we know that the subsurface reactivity is very localized and intermittent, it's not very difficult to understand why we can't really directly compare these two, these two measurements. Because taking an average of processes that are not linear is actually not a good descriptor of nonlinear reactions. Therefore, we can see that it's really hard to transfer the knowledge that we have on lab experiments to the catchment scale if we don't know how the nonlinearity of the processes affect this reaction rate. So based on this, we've, we, we were motivated to say, well, then it means one scale. The scale that is missing is actually to do an experiment to directly measure these kinetics, but not in the lab, but directly on the field. So that was our first motivation. The second motivation was the fact that I've told you before that microbes could play a major role, but most of the experiments don't take into account these microbes in the lab, while at the catchment scale, they could be very important. So that was our second motivation. And based on these two motivations, we have built up different experiments. All right, we've chosen one site, once again, the Guidel site. Why? Because, as we've seen before, the, this site was the one that was very reactive, with low contents of oxygen, but some time of the year, we could see that there were inputs of oxygen down in the subsurface. So we've decided to choose this 
observatory and to try to mimic this arrival of oxygen in the ground and to see how does that affect the chemistry of the groundwater. All right, so now I think that you've understood that most of what I've said before was actually the reaction of iron with oxygen. And the reason why we targeted this reaction is because um, iron comes from weathering reactions. So iron comes from the interaction of water with rocks, while oxygen comes only directly from surface inputs because it comes from the atmosphere. And what's also interesting is that this reaction is actually very important in crystalline environments. It's often the first weathering re reaction that occur. And the second reason why it's interesting is because this reaction has actually two ways. One abiotic ways, one chemical ways, and another biotic way, which means that there are some microbes in the subsurface that are actually able to use the energy from this reaction to grow which means that these microbes would mediate the reactions, this reaction and then use it as their energy to grow. So there is both bi biotic and abiotic interactions that we must be able to try to differentiate. All right, so the first experiment that we did is a tracer experiment. The idea is, as I said before, to mimic the arrival of oxygen in the ground and see how the groundwater chemistry responds to that uh, entry of oxygen. All right, to do that, we use some um, lab facilities directly on the field. So here is a picture of the experiment. So the idea is to take one well, that's, let's say, a relevant well, and then to put what we call a packer in the ground, which is uh, an instrument that allows us to put it at the depths that we are interested in. Remember that I told you before that one well is often only representative of one fracture. So we go and we target this fracture, and then um, we can use these packers that are inflatable, and then once it's inflated in the well, only this fracture is isolated. And then we can directly work at a scale that is relevant because it's really the fracture scale of our um, aquifer. So this is what we do. We inject some oxygen in the media through this fracture. Then we pump the water. We let it react in the, in the subsurface for a while. Then we pump it back. And then when we pump it back, we measure a certain um, amount of elements. So first we had a water sampling zone that was used for um, microbe uh, sampling for microbe analysis that I will talk later. And then we had this mobile lab that we have developed. So the idea is here to bring the lab directly to the field and to allow to have innovative in situ and high frequency measurements of, what, uh, of the water. So here you see two different labs. The first one was dedicated to the measurement of dissolved gas with um, a new instrument that is called a MIMS that uh, Elliot is expert of. Here we also measured solutes uh, at high frequency. And on the other lab here we were following the in situ monitoring because we, we installed also some probes directly in the packers to also follow some physical parameters. All right, so if I've summed up the experiment, we inject some tracers, both a conservative tracer and a reactive tracer. When we inject them, they look the same. Then we let both of them react in the ground and then we pump them back. And what we observe is actually that the quantity of oxygen that we get back, it's much lower than the quantity of the conservative tracer that we use, meaning that the oxygen has actually been consumed in the ground. And this is what we are going to have a look at. How can we use this breakthrough curve to try to better understand the reaction that occurred in the ground while we were just waiting at the surface and couldn't see anything? So here is the zoom on the results. So the same curve, here you have logarithmic scale though, here you have the conservative tracer and the reactive tracer, together with the measurements that we did of iron. And what you see is that the consumption of oxygen is actually correlated with also a consumption of iron, which means that it seems that there is some iron oxidation and oxygen reduction. During this experiment, we did three sampling spots which is 
what I told you before, in order to have a look at how microbes reacted to this injection of oxygen. Here are the results. So for these three different times, what we see is right after the input of oxygen, we clearly see that there is a huge increase of the global reactivity by microbes that is seen by the increase in the amount of DNA and RNA in the system. And if we want to have a look a little bit deeper at, okay, microbes in general have reacted, but which microbe did react? So here what you have is a classification with families of the different microbes. And what we see is that there is a clear increase in the contribution of Gallionellaceae. And the Gallionellaceae are the microbes that I've told you before that are actually using the reaction of oxygen with iron to grow. So here is, we show that this, with this experiment, what we show is that the, the arrival of oxygen in the ground in a context where iron is present is used, well, it reacts first, and it reacts, and it's also used by the microbes, so microbes really play a role in this reaction. All right, to conclude on this study, we can see that there is a very rapid response of the microbial communities, both in terms of abundance and change in the community. And I, did not, I will not show you the results here, but based on this uh, data, we've been also able to quantify the kinetics. And what is very interesting is that actually the kinetic, that the reaction rate that we quantify is very similar to the one that have been um, first derived in lab experiments. So that actually does not answer the question of this lab field discrepancy, but it's the first reaction rate estimation that we have directly in the field. All right, so this is a short-term evaluation of the kinetics. But as I said before, these moments where oxygen arrives in the ground are actually very rare and arrive only from time to time. So the question is on the long term, what is the reaction rate associated with uh, the subsurface reactivity? So to answer this question, we have built up another experiment that is based on a long-term incubation of minerals in the ground. So the idea was to build up such a design with six different minerals to have a look at how the, each mineral is weathered. And for each of these minerals, we have considered two conditions, one that is by potentially biotic, and the other one where we use the filter to make sure that microbes cannot reach the mineral. Then what we did is that we actually built two of these um, setups that we've installed one in the recharged water, which is at the top of the hill, where the water is actually oxic and acid, and the other one at the discharge zone of the catchment, where the water is now anoxic and neutral. So, here are a few results. So this work, this is what Bastien has done, and here are the results that I'm going to show you only on the calcite. And what we see here is images of the retreat of the surface of the mineral. So they use some um, witness mounts to have an idea of the initial uh, surface, and everything that is in between is what has actually been retreated because of weathering. So here we see, that we, do, we can measure a retreat of calcite over the 10 months of incubation in the ground. Then what we did is also to have a look and to look at the, with microscopes, to have a look, well, is there bacteria attached to the surface? And well, we can see that there are bacteria attached, such as here, and we can even see sometimes some ghosts of bacteria meaning that here there used to be a bacteria that has actually dissolved the calcite around it, and now that the bacteria is gone, we still see the imprint of the bacteria. All right, and now if we want to try to quantify a little bit these results, still the result for the calcite, we have few measurements. This, this work is still preliminary and still um, uh, do on work. But the first result that we have showed two different and very interesting um, patterns. First, we can see that the reaction rate, so this is the retreat under the different conditions to deconvolute the different forcings that we talked about. So first, what we see is that when the condition is biotic, the weathering is much higher when it is antibiotic, when it cannot be biotic, and also that the weathering is much higher in the recharged water, that is 
uh, oxic and acidic than in the discharged water. All right, so this, this work, which is that we are still working on, I think it's really interesting because it shows a new way, a new framework to observe and to quantify these long-term water, rock, and microbe interactions in the subsurface. And this work is actually continued in the framework of Terraforma because it can, not only, it can uh, really help to measure these reactions in the ground, but also we think, and this is something that we want to try, that with this kind of setup, we will be able to select some of the microbes because de depending on the mineral that we use, the microbes that are going to attach to the surface might be very different. And this is something that we want to test in the Terraforma. Okay, that moves me to my last study, which is have a better understanding on how the transport, transport properties would change the, and would control the reactions. All right, we changed Brittany and we now go to Guadeloupe, where uh, Elliot and um, Yotis were a few days ago. And we are going to look at another catchment still in the Oscar, which is the Kirk catchment. So here you see the catchment. And this work was actually motivated by some measurements and observations that were previously done by Jérôme. And what he's seen is that, well, if we go along the river, what we observe is that there is a net increase of the discharge of the river, and that this, this increase of discharge is actually associated with a strong decrease of the strontium isotopic composition. And based on these observations, the question was, well, this observation seems to indicate that there are deep groundwater that arrives at the, um, down, down the, well, here is a nick point, but anyway, down the catchment. And the question was, why is there deep groundwater only arriving in the catchment at the down parts of this uh, catchment? All right. So this is the question that we wanted to answer. And yeah, the reason why we assume that it's deep groundwater is because the strontium isotopic composition is changing, is shifting actually from a value that is close to the rainfall of the rainfall to a value that is close to the signature of the rock. So it shows that this water has seen a lot of interactions between rock and water. So what did we do to answer this question? First of all, Sylvain has worked and he has uh, looked at different seismic profiles. And based on these profiles, what, well, we've used this profile only to try to, to image where is the limit between the weathered zone and the bedrock. And based on uh, the velocity of the, um, the wave velocity in the ground, we were able to map and to really identify this interface, which is the one that we were interested in. And based on these results, um, Sylvain has been able to map the unweathered bedrock interface for the whole catchment. Then what we did is that we used this interface and to Im we implemented this interface in a model, in a very simple reactive hydrogeological model. Why is it simple? Because in terms of reactions, we considered that water that was staying in the weathered zone was actually not reacting. But water, as soon as it reached the bedrock, the reaction was instantaneous and the water and, uh, recalls a concentration of strontium that is the one of the rock, which, which is an assumption, but that, well, let's say it's an assumption. And, but we, we, we went a little bit further in terms of the hydrogeological modeling. So as we saw, there is an weather zone and a bedrock zone. And the question was, well, what transport properties should we use for the unweathered zone and for the bedrock zone to try to simulate the flows. So we, we've only tested three cases. One is homogeneous and the two others are heterogeneous. And we considered either that the transmissive zone was the upper one or the lower one. All right, and the result has actually shown that the only way we were able to simulate the, what we've observed in the river is using the third case. And so in this case, here you have the modeling results of both discharge and of the isotopic composition and isotopic concentration in the river. So here I differentiate between two types of flow paths, the one that have only stayed in the weathered zone that are here in blue and the one that have reached the bedrock that are here in green. 
And what is interesting is that if this case is the only one that is able to reproduce the observations in the river, then what happens in this case to explain this observation? And what's good when you have a model is that you can try to see where the water comes from and what is the structure of the flow path underground. And here you have a cross section of the flow path. What you see is that most of the flow paths actually stay in the upper, in the weathered zone, but that few flow paths can go deeper and reach the bedrock. And then these flow paths actually come back at the uh, outlet of the catchment, which is where we've seen this increase of the, this change in the chemical composition. And what is also interesting is that then we can have a look at all these flow paths we can look at the origin of this flow path depending on whether they have reached the bedrock or not. And what we see is that the, all the flow paths that have been down enough to reach the bedrock, all of them are actually located in a very restricted location of the catchment, which is the upper part of the catchment. On the lower part of the catchment, all water that flows anywhere here actually stayed in the weathered zone and then is not actively contributing to weathering because it's already staying in the place that is already weathered. And here we can do the same, but not looking at what is the origin of the water, but what is the exit of the flow pass. And we see that most flow pass exit in the river and that actually the deep flow pass only exits at the outlet of the river. So I think here, by using this hydrogeological model, we've been able to show that, and maybe that's part of the answer, why we can't compare lab experiments with field scale estimates. It's because actually, on this case at least, weathering is not uniformed all over the catchment. Weathering is actually very localized and restricted to some part of the catchment. So the average at the outlet would of course be much lower than the, the actual weathering that's taking place on the upper part. And here we also see that the underground geomorphology, the fact that the transport properties are very heterogeneous and that it actually, the bedrock is actually more transmissive, has a huge impact on the, on the subsurface flow paths and the subsurface reactivity. All right, I'll end up this with a few take home messages which is, I agree that heterogeneity is a nightmare and that the subsurface is very complex. But however, I still that we really need to try to get more data and to, and to look into it more because every time we do it, we learn something. We've seen that having a look at groundwater really needs these new innovative tools. We wouldn't have been able to do any of that if we didn't have new sensors, new well logging probes, and new, uh, for instance, MIMS and seismic uh, instruments that were able really to monitor and to image the subsurface. I think that with this data, we really use this data and we try to put them every time we could in a model to really get out of our data and take the most of it to try to see, well, what do we obtain in terms of mechanistic and quantitative processes that affect this uh, flow path and reactivity in the ground. And to finish with, what I think is the most important is that we've shown that there is really a clear interplay between the catchment morphology, the water flow path, and reactivity, which is crucial. And I think we are way far from, very far from what Jenny has shown before, to have like really in situ C and Q um, relationships in the ground, because what we have here is only points in the diagram that has been shown before. So maybe we're wrong as well, because maybe we don't have this in situ and high frequency monitoring that allows us to really understand the processes. So I think if we want to better understand, and for instance, if we want to see what is the impact of anthropogenic perturbation or climate change on changes and on the reactivity, we need um, to keep on doing these studies. For instance, I told you we've seen the impact of extreme events that can bring oxygen in the ground, but then how does these extreme events could affect the reactivity of the ground is still an open question that we now have few tools to try to target. Thank you very much.